He's one of the most inspirational dudes on the planet. He is a badass at light heavyweight in the UFC. He used to be a thick boy. Now he's inspiring others and doing the goddamn thing. It's Khalil Roundtree on this week's Food Truck Diaries, and I'm feeding him burgers without the bun. Let's do it. Make it big, big, super thick. From my wallet to my check. I don't want it if it's skinny, but I need it if it's thick. Need a thick girl for the thick boy. I need everything I get, super thick boy. You ready? Used to have a model bitch, now I got a thick one. Yeah, I do. Last night went late, yeah, we had a sick one. Yeah, very drunk. Yeah, and I like options. I don't Khalil, like what's, what's up, up, brother? Thanks for Long having me. Long time no see, my man. Yes, yes, Look yes. at you, <laughs> killing the game. I'm trying to be like you, dog. Oh, man. <laughs> Dude, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. You look great, man. Thanks, man. Me How you too. feeling, brother? Feel good. Feel good. Real good. A uh, little bit busy, but I, I asked for it and I like it. Busy in what way? Like media and stuff? Uh, yeah, media. And then I just feel like my mind hasn't been able to shut off because mm. just like when when fights are over, then just like the creative part of my mind kicks in and like, what do I want to start working on? What projects? What, you know what I mean? What clothing design? What comic book you know just I I, there's a lot of projects going on so so in regards to projects when you're not knocking dudes out with elbows and pride style kicks and we'll get to your fighting your last fight hmm. outside of that uh, you're a creative dude and we'll get then how we know each other back in the day stuff like that but outside of fighting like these projects that you do that's a giant bug welcome to calabasas but um we're talking like like what kind of creative process? So right now the main one is um, I run a brand called Such Limited. It used to be named Super Champ after an idea and a character and a nickname that I was given in Thailand. But um, your nickname was Super Champ. Super Champ, yeah, Super, like Champ? Super Champ. When oh, I'd walk down dope. the street, I'd be like, oh, Super Champ, oh, you know, fantastic. and I'd be like, oh, that's cool, because yeah. it's because like I was the biggest guy out there in Bangkok, Thailand, right? And they knew that I fought. And they were just like, oh, a super champ. They just, so Best nickname I brought it over to America, but it just didn't have the same like essence that it did in Thailand. Like, you know, people were saying like super champ and things like that. So I just reduced it down to such SU from super CH from champ, reduced it down to such. Um, and then I definitely wanted to like up the quality. So such limited because I won't really be making many things. And it's merch, merch, uh, community, like, like, building a discord community that can be in contact with me whatever projects i have going on um but the the overall idea is to just create like a strong brand that i can do you know host skateboarding competitions you know like do martial arts outreach programs all types of stuff so just a solid my lifestyle brand yeah it's super on brand i completely love it as far as the merch goes what are we talking here like streetwear uh skatewear? uh a uh, uh, mixture of like street skate and i definitely like you know high in fashion and like designer Same. stuff but nothing too flashy i like to keep it pretty simple so like basic high quality skate simple. streetwear yeah, yeah simple that's really dope yeah and it's going well uh so far so good yeah i did it i just got a just did a rebrand um, with like a new logo and have some new uh, photographers and stuff that I'm working with. So the vision's now like, it, the, the vision's now coming together. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. I think uh, this year, by the end of this year, I think it'll be like at a really good place. And you moved to New York. Yeah, I moved to New York. From LA? From Thailand. Well, so you went L.A., right? Born and raised in L.A. So I was born in L.A. In, that's why I raised. Made, yeah, yep. born in L.A., raised in Vegas, moved to L.A. to train at Black House, that's where we met. Yep. And Funny then story about I that. went back to Vegas for a bit. And then from Vegas, I went to Europe. From Europe, I went to Brazil. From Brazil, I went to Thailand. And then Thailand, I was there for almost three years. And then I came back to USA. And then why why the New York move? Uh, so, You're a creative dude, I get it. Like the creative like juice is out there. Yeah, so my girl's from New York. Well, she's not from New York, but she lives in New York. Um, and when we met, she also has a connection to Thailand. So we were both over in Thailand and uh, the pandemic happened. And so that's where we were kind of like, okay, are we gonna lock down here? We're we gonna lock down in New York. And we decided to lock down in Thailand. So of course. when we were planning to come back to the States, that's where the decision making happened, where um, we just both decided that we'd want to go to New York. There's some, even with the fight, like obviously fashion and 
all that streetwear stuff you're doing. New York's a mecca of that. So mm-hmm. it's LA, but New York's definitely a mecca of that. But also, as far as the fight game goes, if you wanted to, you could really relocate your entire camp in New York. I mean, there's some monster, monster coaches out there. Absolutely. So, especially in that area. You know? Absolutely. Actually, like, as soon as I go back next week, uh, I decided that that's where I'll do my jiu-jitsu with uh, Marcelo Garcia. Do you know Henzo at all? I don't know Henzo. Oh, man. We should, th- we should call him together while you're here. Cool. Yeah, best. I'm, I'm yeah, definitely open to just, like, there. you know, training with the best. Marcelo's and, obviously, you know, one of the yeah. best to ever do it, but Hen- there's nothing like Henzo, man. Cool. You yeah. would vibe with him I'm not so opposed much. to yeah. to training with the best that there is, man. So, uh, going over your last fight, um, I, I, you know, it's your second win in a row, mm-hmm. so that that's a plus. But I was talking to Chappelle. We have a mutual friend in Chappelle Lacey who yeah. loves you. He told me to tell you what's I up. I love Chappelle. He was going to be here. Shout out Chappelle Shout Lacey. Shout out Chappelle <laughs> Lacey. He was going to be here, but he's in Arizona for family stuff. Ah, uh, okay. But, um... You know, I was talking to Chappelle because, you know, he doesn't know UFC. And I'm like, yeah, you know, Khalil's fighting. He's like, I know, man. I follow him. Both. So you think he's going to win? I'm like, yes, he should win this one. And then uh, both Chappelle and I were like, and I go, I think he's retiring after this. And Chappelle's like, I don't know. He, I, I, I thought he talked about that. I had mentioned it in the past. Yeah. That, that's when I was in Thailand. So, man, when I went over there, it was just, it was such a, I'd never experienced a country like Thailand. And I saw people just, you know, on busy roads selling the cheapest cups of coffee and street food and stuff, you know, definitely struggling to make ends meet, but Third they world. were so yeah. happy. Really? So happy. It's known as the land of smiles and I know exactly why. So it like living in that environment and falling in love with the, the people and the culture, um, you know, like it, it kind of switched my my perspective my perspective and my daily outlook and i started thinking like man like back in america i'm just striving for so much it's a rat you race. know i'm like i want a big car i want a big house i want all this stuff and like look at these people happier than i am like out here selling you know what i mean like whatever it is that they want to sell and so that's kind of where i had i had decided like you know what maybe after my last fight that like you know, I'll be done fighting MMA because I've always also wanted to fight Muay Thai. Mm. Like that's, I just have a love and a passion for Muay Thai. And so you're pretty good at it. Yeah. yeah, and I learned like, that's the first martial art that I ever trained. And it's the, the martial art that seems the most like natural for me to mm-hmm. like pick up. And one month of training in Thailand, I put on the performance against Eric Anders. So like, that's just one month. So yeah. I was like, I want to try to, train for a year and then like actually fight in like a Thai stadium where the guys are betting and I do yeah. my Y crew and every yeah, you know like sick, and, and yeah. honor the gym that I fight for so Rub you down that Thai oil yeah exactly like that's you, all I think about the guys are the guys are back there like talking just like how we are before they fight too it's it's so weird everybody's in the same locker room warming up not even warming up just like you yeah, a lot of them don't even warm up, right? No, they and just get like you know rubbed down in Thai oil, and then they're just like, all right, we're gonna go out, and it's it's just a whole different, different approach culture, to fight. right? Yeah, I th- also I don't mean to interrupt you. I also think too, it's like in both senses, like the fighting is you know they start when they're kids. Like mm-hmm. some of those kids have I don't know a thousand fights by the time they're fifteen. You know yeah, what I'm it's, so it's like it's like us playing football or pickup basketball. They do Muay Thai, but then also with the perspective of. You know, the guy selling coffee, which, did you try the coffee or a coffee guy? Oh, yeah, amazing. Is it nice? Amazing. All right, I'd like to go there now. Too far a flight, but whatever. Um, but with the coffee, it's like uh, how happy you see them. It's all perspective, right? Ignorance mm-hmm. is bliss. Because you grew up in L.A. and Vegas. They've been in New York. So it's like, I even if you move to Thailand, and th- I'm not hating on you if you want to move to Thailand, but because of the perspective you have and the way you've come up and what you know, it's gonna be tough to be as happy as that guy who's taking a piss on the side of the sol- sidewalk. So absolutely, coffee. absolutely. Um, so yeah, it was a, it was a mixture of that, man. Like just kind of being in that in that atmosphere, seeing a whole different approach to fighting, and that's kind of what brought up the the idea of retirement. But during the pandemic, and you know, that was just a lot of time to reflect, right? In indoors, internally. For everybody. For if you everybody. didn't come out a better person after this pandemic, yeah, you wasted your life, man. Yeah, because it forced everybody, and you're like me, a creative, and then also like we go, go, go. And that pandemic it's forced us to shut down. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, what's important, man? And I realized, me personally, I was like, oh, I, 
I tore, I worked too much. I tore too much, man. Mm -hmm. I gotta be at home more for the kids. That's yeah. what I gotta do. Yeah, it was very similar. And but for me personally, it was a thing of like, I just had this feeling like, no, I'm not done. And just you know, just like I said in my post fight interview, it's like, man, I really think that like. <coughs> I have a story that can be shared that can help other people that were like me that like literally had no idea of any type of direction on where they wanted to go, what they wanted to be, or any even like care to wake up in the morning the next day. You know what I mean? And Agreed. I was like, I, I look at you almost like a superhero where you have this responsibility. With great mm -hmm. power comes great responsibility, Spider Man quote. But um, because of your background, because of what you represent, to me, and this is what I told Chappelle, I go, it'd be a shame if he was done. Mm -hmm. Chappelle's like, really? And he knows, like, I like when guys retire and move on to something else, like what I did. I love when guys have a career even bigger after the UFC, which you're going to have. I just told Chappelle, I'm like, it'd be a shame if he stopped right now. Mm -hmm. He's still young. He's still getting better every fight. People love to watch him. And it's like, his name's also never been bigger. So to walk away now, I just don't, I'm, I'll do what, I'm down for whatever you want to do. I'll support yeah. whatever you want. But you just have so much more to do and so many more young kids who are like you that you can inspire and I don't think they have a lot of role models like that if that makes sense same yeah. same and that's that's a part of of um of yeah like why why I chose to come back and it would be a shame and I think you mentioned like something along the lines of like being like a superhero in a sense and when I was in Thailand, that's when I actually started writing a story about a superhero, Love a black it. superhero yep. named Super Champ. So it's like, resembles me, but it's not me. But the story that I've tied into it has a lot of similarities. The background and stuff. The background, you know what I mean? And, and the, the just like the emotional response to life. And I mean, just Your background, like, you're basically Bruce Wayne. You're Batman, right? Yeah, kind of. But not, your parents yeah. weren't rich. Yeah, though. exactly. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's like, things like that like I think when I when I'm done with fighting and I look back I want to be able to see like the 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 canvas that I pre that I painted right mm -hmm. I want to be able to look back and say what did I create out of out of all of this you know out of all of these tools and these experiences like what did I make out of it and one of them is like yeah I don't personally want to be the superhero because I'm just like you know a sensitive guy and I react to a lot but if I could just creative like if I can create one and create a story about one that I would still dream to be it would yep. be beautiful you know yeah, what I mean I love that with your post fight speech that has gone viral everywhere mm. that was obviously an organic moment and I I, I don't know uh, what journalist asked the question but he was searching Felder. for some, Felder oh yeah. was it who, who it was Paul Felder. Paul Felder? Yeah. Oh, shout out to Paul Felder. Yeah, seriously. I don't know that's Paul Felder. I love yeah, Paul Felder. I love Paul yeah, Felder. He's a great dude. <laughs> Crushing it too. Oh, Such yeah. a good analyst. Shout oh, out to yeah. Paul Felder. But um, you know, I love he was like, you know, kids that were like you watching this at home. That had to trigger something because I don't think the audience realizes if you've been through a fight, like when you're done, win or lose, it's so emotional. Mm -hmm. It's like this roller coaster. And again, win or lose, there's a sense of relief there's a sense of pride and then you're also i remember win or lose especially after a win if i would like knock the gap in 47 seconds i was so happy i as soon as i got to the back uh where the curtains are i get, get on my hands and knees i'm not a religious dude i'd pray to whatever it was absolutely just being like thank god i'm not hurt man absolutely thank you for not letting me get hurt yeah. i was so relieved and emotional i cried damn near after every fight i'm sensitive like you are same. So yeah. <laughs> for you, when, when Paul Felder asked that question, you know, obviously you're high on emotions, but you, you've obviously, you know, you know that you, that this narrative, right? Like, you know, you have to tell this story and that came out so, so organically. And I think that's why it resonates with everybody. Cause I do think there are a lot of kids who, you know, don't come from the best background or maybe they've lost a parent or they have dreams to do something else and you're the guy doing it, mm. which gives them you know, so much more hope, I would say. Yeah, man, that that actually, you know, sometimes as fighters, I'm sure you've had the experience where like, you're trying to visualize a win and you're like, what am I gonna say after this? And I didn't have any idea of anything until the day of the fight. I was on the couch and I was like, I need to take a nap. I had a lot of energy. I wanted to run six miles you know like I had so much energy and I was like you know what I don't want to burn out let me just take a nap yeah so as I'm taking a nap and my heart's just pounding and just like dealing with like just the pressure of fight day 
Um, I started, nothing worse, by the way. No, nothing worse. You're hanging worse. out the day of the fight, and you're hanging in the hotel, yeah. and you know you got to fight this monster at 7 p.m. Exactly. You're you know the time looking, and the day. You look at yeah. the clock, like, all right, they told me I would be ready at 4. Okay, yeah. here we go. <laughs> it's 7 a.m. Exactly. Like, oh, my God. And, yeah. and so I started asking myself, like, why do I do this? I'm like, why? Every time I ask myself I'm, that. I'm like, why? Why, yeah. why do I do this? I'm going outside. I went outside. woke up from the nap. I'm pacing around. I'm asking myself, like, man, why am I doing this? And that's when it came. The and why for, came. For those, for those other kids. Just for, for telling my story, for, yeah. for, to, for showing, not even necessarily telling the story, but for, like, letting people know, like, who I am and what I'm about. And, like, and, you know, when I get interviewed in, in media, it's like they see me as just this UFC fighter that's, you know, vicious in the cage. And I'm just like, when I go back and read it, I'm like, yeah, but you missed a fucking Correct. huge part, man. Yep. You missed the biggest part of it all. Yep. And so that's kind of when I started thinking. So the, for, from that moment on, the rest of the day, I was just in the why. Like, okay, why? Okay, yeah, you're right. That's a yeah, good that why. is why. That's a good Because why. your dad, because your mom, because you know, how they raised you and what you went through and all the weight you lost and the sacrifice and the blood, just everything started to hit me at once. And then that's when just my focus was like, Boom. like laser, like nothing in the world could touch me at that moment. I like, love it. As soon as I got it, I just, I felt like I had this like supercharged power, like unstoppable. What, what a great reason of why you got an answer. And I don't mean to put more pressure on you, but when I was talking to Chappelle about it, you know, I told him this, I said, he almost can't stop. He owes it to those kids mm -hmm. to keep going through this and be a, a, a role model. Yeah. It's, it, you know, it's tough to say it puts pressure on you, which you're fine with pressure. It's what you signed up for. Mm -hmm. It's like you owe it to these other kids who need that role model. Man. They're yeah. not getting it. You're not getting Hollywood. You're not getting it, you know, in other sports, really, because they're not telling their story. Hollywood, nobody can relate to. But you, they can. You're touchable. They can see it, you know? Yeah, for sure. And I think... I think one thing that 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 stands out and it stood out to me today on the plane is I don't necessarily want to like inspire everybody to become a fighter because I know that this isn't all that I'm going to be. No, it's you know, more like than that. I just acted in my first movie. You know, I'm like doing stuff with the brand, uh, all of these things that I'm like, I just want to be able to live freely and almost like just be an example if nothing else. But but fighting is that pathway, it gives you the platform that's gonna be able to branch off to all the other stuff you can do. Yeah, you know it, gave, it gave fighting me- Fighting is such a small sliver of what you do, mm. but it gives you this huge platform to inspire all these other kids. Yeah, you know? and it, 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 it gave me my health back, right? Like my health and just like courage to take on life you know, and, and things like that. So like, yeah. Yeah, we're gonna get to that whole weight loss thing. Sick. Speaking of weight loss, um, let me feed you. Yeah, let's do, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. Let's take a little break from chatting with my brother from another mother, Cleo Roundtree, on this episode of Food Truck Diaries. Because, fellas, I'm out there on the streets. I'm getting coffee. I'm touring all around. I'll be in Chicago this weekend. And I will bet my bottom dollar when I meet a lot of you bros out there you're losing your hair, man. You're losing your hair, and two out of three men will experience some form of hair loss by the time that they're 35. More than 50 million bros in the U.S. suffer from male pattern baldness. It ain't good. You're looking like George Costanza out there, and my friends at Keeps, they got you covered, man. Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors. They're the only two FDA-approved medications that can prevent hair loss my friends at Keeps offers both. That's right. Keeps offers a simple, affordable, and stress-free way to keep your freaking hair. They have 24-7 care and support. All right? It's low cost. Treatments are just 10 buckaroos a month to keep your hair, man. Keeps offers generic versions of the two FDA-approved medications to prevent hair loss. Treatment plans are affordable, typically half the cost of pharmacy prices. So what are you doing, man? Save hair. Save your money as well. All right? Remember, prevention is key. Treatments can take four to six months to see results, so you need to act right now before you're straight up bald. When it comes to your hair, save more, spend less. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash shab, S-C-H-A-U-B, to receive your first month of treatment for free. That's keeps, K-E-E-P-S dot com slash shab to get your first month free, keeps.com slash shab.
How you doing, boss? Good, Thanks for doing good. this, man. Appreciate you. Of course. Um, look at the menu. I will keep it carnivore. I will do the uh, the smash burger, the double patty, just no bun. You got it. That's it. No fries oh, either so for me. I got you. Yep. I want the same exact thing. You got it, man. Same we'll exact it, thing, but can we'll I get... make it a double. We got you guys. Give me about a few minutes and I'll knock it out for you guys. But okay. you want fries, can you, right? Can you throw please? a side of fries, please? Okay. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, sir. All right, my man. Let's let's, let's feed you. Dog. How uh, how's the diet been? Are you one of those guys that gets done fighting, go pretty crazy on the diet, or does the I old school I'm, fat kid genes in you still? You still kind of well. I got the fries, right? I think it? I think that's a part that is never gonna go away. Is I'm always gonna love French fries. Yeah, like, I just have a passion for fries, man. Uh, but in the past, I would go ham, like pancakes, donuts, sugar. But you know, like you. The, the past two camps, I've I've kept it. You know, pretty clean, and I think this camp I really plan to keep it clean. Do you have to like really watch what you eat because you have those? I don't because you have great genetics, but so but if you got kind of wild out, do you blow up? Only if I'm not working out. Yeah. Like if I'm still training, then it's almost like I can eat, you know I can eat whatever I want. But if I'm not you know if I'm not training, then I, I definitely have to to keep it clean. Man. I think that's where it gets dicey for a lot of guys when they retire. They eat like they were when they were fighting, but they forget they're not working out anymore. Yeah. And then they really balloon up. And not even like half as hard, right? <laughs> no, I, mean, I mean, I have a quarter as hard. These training camps are nuts. So go, going back, how old were you when you were at your heaviest? Uh, nineteen. Nineteen. So not, I mean, not that young. So no. nineteen. How we're talking. 300 even or what are we talking about? Here? 305 is like what I remember seeing on the scale like days before I joined the, the gym at the MMA or at, uh, at Vanderlei's because at that time when, when I was finding out about MMA we'd watch fights and it was like oh in this corner weight class you know I was learning about weight classes and all of that so I remember stepping on the scale and seeing 305 and seeing that there was no weight class for someone who was 300 There's and no super pounds. heavyweight weight class you, you yeah. know in the UFC reason, at the time yeah. so um, yeah, I was 19, 305 on the scales, and and what? It, but what inspired the the MMA route, the fighting route? So, I think it had a lot to do with my background in like hardcore music and heavy, like heavy metal and punk rock, just like a heavier, like aggressive music. Yeah, um, I found a lot of refuge in like the shows and the concerts and the mosh pits. Uh, and, mod, you, you know what I mean? And, and like the, the, the chaos. Yeah. Like I could never go and pick a fight with somebody and I didn't like confrontation, you know, one on one. But the first time I went to like a punk rock show, uh, it was it was wild. And I saw people just like screaming and jumping and jumping off the stage and stepping on each other's heads. And I was just like, ah, and I finally tried it. And it was just such this release of all of this stuff that I had, you know what I mean? Just, yeah, just everything built up. And that was like my place where I felt like I could set, like I can let it free. And isn't so, that weird that that, like you found comfort in that chaos, even though it's, it is controlled chaos and Chappelle does that all the time. But again, we keep talking about Chappelle Lacey, same thing. He was a kid who came from, you know, a pretty rough uh, childhood. And then he found the same kind of outlet with punk rock, punk rock music and, you know, doing these mosh bits, stuff like that. My only caveat with that is both you guys, like, you know, you don't see a lot of black guys in the mosh pit. You mm. know what I'm saying? Like, it's a pretty white thing. Like, yeah. those, those punk rock concerts you're going to, so did you feel like an outcast during that, or did, it, I, it didn't matter? Do I felt like an outcast my whole life, so. Yeah, I still do. Yeah. Like, my, when, after my father died, so I was born here in L.A., after my father died. How old were you? I was only two. Oof. So, like, my mom at the time, so she had three boys, right? And my grandmother was dying, She who lived in Vegas, so we went out there to take care of her. And so when we decided that, my mom decided that this is where we're gonna live in Las Vegas, she made sure that with whatever money she had that she got us in like a nice neighborhood. So 
my brothers were like more active guys. They played sports, you know, they were like lighter skin. None of my brothers, we, none of us look alike. They had lighter skin, kind of pretty boy guys, got all the girls, all this stuff. But I, my dad, I have a separate dad, but he was a bigger guy. So as I grew, I just like started to blow up and be chubby in face. And, and was your dad chubby? Uh, yeah, he was like 340, 6'6". Six, six. Damn. Like big, big. Yeah, dude. big dude. Thick boy. Yeah, for Real sure. Thick, thick boy. boy, yeah. yeah. Thick boy so, security, right? Um, so just like, you know, that that whole process, I just, I don't know. I, I My brothers were athletes. I didn't want to be an athlete. Um, I liked music and of, of all sorts. And so like, I just was really struggling to find like, where do I fit in? And then yeah. like, you know, I went through a phase of when I started learning heavier music, like I was very you know, similar to some people where like, I liked the more like punk rock look or like, you know, all black clothing and yeah. chains and spikes. And like, I just felt like that was kind of my protective, you know what I mean? Like sure. barrier, because yeah. I, I was sensitive. And like, so yeah, it was just kind of like outcasted. So just having that, those layers around me as a kid is kind of what drew me to the music. And then the aggression in the music and the MMA is kind of what like Mesh meshed together. together. And I was like, ah, oh, there, there, there might be a place for me in, in this, you know? And then the love for music it comes from your pops. Was it, he had something to do with, boy, is it Boys to Men? Yeah, so I think, I think it has a lot to do with, like as a kid, you know, knowing, before I even knew what like death was and all of that, I do remember I'd walk down the hallways and I'd see platinum and gold records from New Edition and Boys to Men and, and and Morris Day and everything with my name on it, and which is also my dad's name. That's so cool. So just those like subconscious memories For of sure. seeing like platinum and gold records in the house, and seeing my dad in like a super fly suit posing with you know Prince and you know just Nuts. so many people and like. And what wow, did my... your dad do exactly? In music. For Boyz II Men, he was like their road manager. Oh wow. Um, but it was a little bit more than that from the stories that I've heard like they slept on the couch and you know it was more like a father figure you know what i mean yeah and so protector uh, yeah like a protector and like kind of like their guidance because being young boys on the road you know like they need somebody who's kind of like a dad weird, yeah. right Hell like these yeah. guys were young man and your dad's six six big dude you like, know so he sense. was like kind of in Business charge of, savvy yeah, yeah so in charge of just kind of guiding them and helping them make you know decisions and stuff like that. And did did your father pass away on the road with them? If yeah, you so me asking, you know it's I okay. Know, it's a yeah. it's the story. So, my dad was on tour with Boys to Men. The tour was Boys to Men, MC Hammer. Oh, fantastic. 1992. Um, in short, they had you know they had their concert, their show, and um, after the show, while my father was in the hotel, there was two guys that had planned to rob him. And like break in and rob because my dad you know he liked to wear ju jewelry and mm -hmm. very nice guy like you know clean cut what city is this uh chicago mm -hmm. so some stuff happens you know like they disturb the room he comes out fight breaks out uh one of the guys had a gun you know they're getting in a fight a tussle um and it resulted in them shooting my dad and, and killing him on the spot so senseless so yeah, like so stupid yeah, so there's a bunch of other stuff where, like, the guy only got, like, you know, six years in prison for it. And, yes. you know, there just there was just so much, like, weird stuff to it. And okay. I all the stories that I heard from everyone who knew my father was, like, how amazing of a person he was. I bet. And how he was, like, your dad bought me my first car. He took me here. He introduced me to this. And he bought me my first suit. And just so many good things. And as a kid, I'm like, I got none of that. That's such a bummer. You know what I mean? Like, but, I, you, but you did get some of that. You know what I'm saying? Like, you're such yeah. a good person. You're such a good human being, especially with the background that you have. A lot of that's in your DNA, man. It's from your pops, you know? Even though he's not here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, yeah, that's really cool, man. It, obviously, it's a terrible, terrible tragedy, but your dad would be so proud. You know that, yeah? Yeah, that'd be, yeah. Yeah, that means a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think so, like, just how I processed all of the information of all of that, I think is what caused this like anger within me, you know, and like this anger. And I'm assuming you didn't talk to a therapist or anything like that, you just held everything in? Yeah, I always, like, especially as a kid, I held everything in. You know, the quiet guy, shy, you know, I was like, I think my mom was like the closest to me because both of my brothers were just happy to go outside and 
be playing sports. And, yeah. You know what they I mean? Had that outlet. I was more like, I like to stay at home and lock myself in my room and teach myself how to play music. Yep. Or I made friends with some of the kids in the neighborhood who skateboarded yep. and things like that. And so I just took a different route, like culturally. Yeah. You know what I mean? Makes sense. You yeah. went that route. <clears throat> so when obviously you, you see the aggression and the, the mosh pit stuff like that. And at what point were you like, all right, I need to lose weight so I can actually compete as a, and initially when you're like, all right, you're, you know, you're sitting on the couch, you're doing a pound, you have titties, right? You're yeah. like, all right, I want to, was it like, I want to fight in the UFC? No. Or so you just want to get like one step at a time. It's always been, I remember, so after high school, I went through, from my, my experience of high school was, you know, like I said, feeling out of place, kind of feeling bullied a little bit, not really knowing where do I fit in in the world, where do I fit in in, in this, like, you know, in school. So I knew I wasn't going to go to college because I didn't want to have the same experience sure. in, in, in the same place. So some of my friends who were successful at the music that they played, um, they got a record deal and they were like, okay, we're going to go on tour. Do you want to come with us and sell merch? And I was like, they were like, we get to travel every day. We get to go around the world. And, you know, the label will pay you daily just for being with us, That's you know. Dope. And you can make tips. So they, like, they pitched me this idea of, like, traveling and being at shows every day for two and a half months at a time. Which is a priceless kind of life lesson, too. Yeah. Especially what you're doing now. Yeah. yeah. So fresh out of high school, that's what I chose to do. And... There was a moment where, so on the road, it was like cigarettes, alcohol, fast food, gas station food, you know, no working out. Like I'm just sitting at a table all day selling t-shirts. Yeah. How do I pass time? Just smoking, you know, soda, whatever. So a few years of that um, stacked on to like just the lifestyle I had already li been living, like the health, you know, my lifestyle was unhealthy. Um, there was a point where I was 19 and we were on a break from tour and I'm just like, I had a heart scare. Oh damn. Yeah. From just everything that I bet. was going Smoking, on, you know, like, like crap. I'm trying to fall asleep and I just feel, it felt like my heart was struggling to just like stay, Jesus. like to stay around yeah, and it, it, scary. it scared me. Yeah. So, um, not, not too long after that, we went on our next tour, which was my last and, on the road, there's a bunch of time to think. And I started like looking at everything differently and I'm like, these guys are doing something that they love to do. Correct. They're getting all of this acknowledgement. They're playing stages every night. People are lining up to meet them in line. And like, they're living the dream and we're all the same age. Yep. And I'm like, and I'm just some extra guy that like is helping them sell their t-shirts, you know? And so, um, just like reflecting i'm like i have to do something different like and that heart scare really messed me up thank god you know what i mean yeah. so like i was just like i think the number one thing that i'm gonna do when i get back home is i'm gonna like join a gym or lose weight or something and so um uh yeah i had like i had on that break and around the heart scares when i saw mma with my brother he kind of introduced me to what it is you so. see yeah, so he was watching the Ultimate Fighter. What season? Uh, the Rampage season when he tore down the door. Oh wow, that was and my season. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah, you were on that season. Yeah, it was. So. Um, yeah. Go on. <laughs> so. Biggest season ever. It's well, here's big. here's why I said it that way, because when I saw him tear down the door, I saw the aggression. All the aggression. And I think the door is fake, but yeah, I hear you. And that's when I was like, you know what? I feel like I can be in the group of these people. Like, I just feel like I belong yeah, yeah, yeah. in that. That you looks know what I mean? cool, yeah. Like, that these guys, sense. there's a part of them that's angry. There's a part of them that's badass. You know, and I was like, this could be sick. So I I told the guys on the tour, and I was like, hey, this might be my last tour. I don't think I'm going to come back again. Like, I think I want to work out, get in shape, and, like, potentially, like, fight. Yeah. And they were like, yeah. Yeah, good luck with that. And then they're showing yeah. me photos like, oh, who, like, this guy showed me Bob Sapp photos. Like, <laughs> No, Jesus I swear, Christ. Swear. No, like Bob Sapp. This, like this, like the the phone was being passed around the the van. Like Bob Sapp. Oh, look, Khalil, <laughs> Khalil in ten years, you know. Like, and I'm like, oh yeah, like little they know you beat the shit up Bob Sapp. <laughs> you know, like you. 
like, you know, like, like laugh it up, laugh it up. Dude, yeah. So, um, yeah, it was Pop like, sad. yeah, that's dude, I, pr I promise you, that's the fighter. Oh, this could be like, you. You're like, I mean, f no, that guy's a monster. No, yeah, man. yeah, yeah. There's weight classes, fools. <laughs> like, I don't even know what they Googled to even, like, get a picture of Bob Sapp. Especially no one then, knew about he was MMA. So massive. Yeah. He was so big. Yeah. Huge. No one yeah. knew about MMA back then in, in my circle of friends. So, like, what did they Google? Bob, you yeah, know? I wonder what they did. So, um, that's so funny, Bob. So, yeah, that was, that was my last tour. And then when I got back, my brother and I. Uh, started watching more videos. He showed me Vanderlei Silva. He's like, look at this guy. He's called the Axe Murderer. And I saw him. And he's, like, he's doing this. Yeah, he's doing that. And he's like soccer kicking people. And he's yeah. doing all this crazy stuff. And I was like, I want to fight like him. And then lo and behold, his gym was in Las Vegas. Before we get back to the show with my boy Khalil Roundtree on this episode of Food Truck Diary, listen, we all dads out there. The one thing you know you're getting older, you got kids. The one thing you care about not as much as your kids, but damn close is your lawn. There ain't nothing like a green lawn, man. It's hard to imagine spring is almost here. It's popping around here in L.A. It's getting hot, man. We're so close to feeling that soft grass on our feet. The kids are playing on it. But you need to get your lawn right. And thankfully, Sunday gets your lawn growing and helps keep it healthy all season long. Your boy got the greenest lawn you've ever seen. Looks like a golf course. Thanks to my friends at Sunday. All right, and you're worried about all the chemicals you're using to keep your yard looking fly. Traditional lawn care lays down 90 million pounds of pesticides each year. Save it, dude. Sunday is different. They're on a mission to change how people care for their yards. All right, Sunday is so different. Now you don't have to choose between having a beautiful yard and keeping your family out of harm's way. We got you, man. Sunday can help you grow a beautiful lawn that all your neighbors will be jealous of without the guesswork or the nasty chemicals. All right, just attach the ready to use pouch to a garden hose and spray away. Takes less than 15 minutes. You got 15 minutes for a green lawn? All you dads out there, I think you do, man. Best of all, this stuff really works. Sunday's offering you guys who are watching this episode of Food Truck Diaries, Khalil Roundtree, they're offering you 20% off, man. 20% off. Full season plans start at just 129 bucks. You can get 20% off at checkout when you visit getsunday.com slash shop20. That's 20% off your custom plan at getsunday.com slash shop20. Get your lawn green. Let's get back to the program. Now, let me tell the viewers something about this, though. That, that gym, Vanderlei Silva's gym in Vegas, that gym, especially back then when you went there, was notoriously known as, like, a tough gym. Like, it, it's not like now where guys take care of each other. Like, a lot of people were scared to go in there because you'd go in there and get knocked out. Like, it was known as, like, a rough, rough gym. Kind of like, you know, Vanderlei comes from the old shoot box days in Brazil. Like, in training, completely different now. Now it's more of a professional approach. But Vanderlei Silva's approach to the game, his nickname's the Axe Murder, right? <laughs> so his whole thing was in training, they would literally try to knock each other out. Yeah. Like it was so, so you, not only did you, you know, at 300 pounds decide to sign up for a gym, but you signed up for the roughest, toughest gym in all of the nation. Absolutely. Which is insane. And so how did it go there? So the first, um, you know, when, when on the, like we watch all of his videos and when they introduce him, I don't know if they still do it, but like Bruce Buffer, like this fighter specializes in Muay Thai and yeah. Jiu Jitsu. And so I started asking my brother, like, hey, what's the difference? Like, what's Muay Thai and what's Jiu Jitsu? He's like, Muay Thai is more like the punching and the kicking. I was like, that's what I want to learn. So when we went to sign up and they gave us like the membership like plan, like, what do you want to sign up for? I didn't have the money to do the full package. So you had to pay I was going to pay for both of us. Yeah. So I paid for Muay Thai. Um that's what like so that was my first my first class and so um I did the class and after the trainer was like, Hey, have you done this before? I'm like, No, never. He's like, I think you have like a like a oh, natural wow, talent. Cool. He's like, You should come back. That goes such a long ways with a Especially young mind. A young such mind a who has no idea, who's never really been like you know, like accepted in sports or whatever. And I never even wanted to play sports or I never even, yeah. So whatever, he, he's like, yeah, come back um, tomorrow, whatever, 11 o'clock. That, that so, goes such a long way. Yeah, that made me really happy. And I'm like, wow, I'm welcome at this place. And so um, that's just kind of how everything kick-started. Yep. Yeah. Put the fire underneath you. Mm -hmm. Did you ever get to spar with Vanderlei Silva? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So. I mean, literally the scariest as, guy. 
in training, scariest as, guy of all time. As my him or Vanderlei or him or uh, Verdum. As my training. training, as my skills got better, um, is when they started like throwing me in, and so when I was on the journey of losing 100 pounds, I had already sparred Vanderlei maybe like two or three times before my first amateur fight, and Did he it light was you up? oh yeah, Damn. I mean. And like you said, it's 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 one of those gyms where, like, I know he wasn't purposely trying to kill me, but there is really no limit as to how far the sparring goes. It's also, you know it's also I mean? to his defense, is all he knows. Yeah, it's like, all he knows. That's his perspective. He's like, this is what I did. It's when like I was you your ready, age. you ready? Okay, yeah. go. And if you're not ready, you shouldn't be in here. Exactly, yeah. and that's what most people who like that's the message that was given. Hey, if you like, if you're stepping on the mat, you're you gotta be ready to go. You gotta be ready to go. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I didn't really know what I was doing, um, but I was a big guy, and he saw that I had heart, that, you know. Which is like, everything. And so, yeah, I took my beatings pretty early. And then uh, he just was... just kept going back. He, kept going back. Yeah, and he was so supportive, man. And, like, my first amateur fight, he was there. My first amateur title fight, he was there and held my hand. The and legend. Like, put the legend. belt, you know, and he yeah. always just had nothing but good things to say about me. And so... There was just that time where, like, Vanderlei Silva, like, giving me this acknowledgement and being there and supporting me and kind of lifting me up was it's just, huge. it was a huge, a huge thing. And so, yeah, we, we had a lot, of, uh, a lot of good sparring matches. I bet, man. I, uh, None of which I won. <laughs> you know, or like, dude, nightmare. Or he, like nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. Complete it's, nightmare. It's, it's one of those things. He's so scary and hits so hard He's and has no, has no like stop button. No, so. there's no like, you know, cars have like different gears, like second, third or fourth. There, He skips that. It's first or fifth. Yeah. And it's usually fifth all the time. Yeah. It's so intense. <laughs> like you came up in just, I mean, just the roughest way possible. But I, I'll tell the story about Khalil. So I, uh, when I was fighting the UFC, when I moved to LA, my, my camp consisted of like Henner Gracie and Rain. I do my wrestling, and I do all my sparring and uh, stand up at Black House. And Black House, I don't know if it's still there. They made a new one. They made a new one. Mm -hmm. But Black House was a gym where Anderson Silva was there, Ed Suarez was uh, one of the owners, and also the manager of Big Nog, Anderson Silva, you know, any Brazilian fighter, he represented them. So they had uh, there at the gym, I would train with Anderson Silva, Leona Machida. Uh, Verdun would come sometimes, uh, Ishii, it was just a room full of killers, killers. Volkov from Bellator would come in there where I'd spar with him all the time. Mont and Pat Cummings, monsters, <coughs> monsters. So I'm getting ready, I'm in camp, and uh, I've never met Khalil before, and me and Anderson sparred, Anderson jumps out, and uh, Khalil gets in, I've never seen him, but he's in good shape at this time. And in my head, I'm, I'm thinking, I was like, so, you know, some young kid or whatever. I, you know, I was pretty well known in the UFC. In my head, I'm like, I'm some young kid. I should probably take it easy on him, something like that. And uh, Anderson uh, doesn't say anything. He just goes, good luck. And I'm like, all right, whatever, dude. And I go, and have you ever seen, me, me and Khalil are sparring. You know? <laughs> have you ever seen uh, in Rush Hour where Chris Tucker's about to fight all those Asian dudes? <laughs> and when he kicks him in the face, he's like, all right, which one of y'all kicked me? <laughs> Dude, I got lit up like a Christmas tree. Cause I, had no, I, I didn't know he was that good. And the round gets done. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Someone should give me a heads up. And someone goes, he, you know, that gentle high voice. Yeah. He very good. He very good. <laughs> he very good. And he goes, you used to be fat boy. You used to be fat boy. I'm like, okay. You know, and that's how I was introduced to. I'm like, dude, his stand-up's ridiculous. And then Machida's like, yeah, he gives me fritz, man. And I'm like, what the... Why the fuck is he in the UFC? And they're like, he'll get there. Give it time, he'll get there. And I just remember you're just such a monster. And then your story's so crazy because uh, I think Machida was telling me too. He was telling me, he goes, yeah, he used to sell fight gear at, mm -hmm. at the OTM shop. I'm like, really? He's like, he used to fight, sell fight gear. Now he's here with us. I was like, that is fucking insane, dude. Yeah, that, that's what got me my opportunity to come out to Cali. So, um, the job, I used to have a job at Jimmy John's before in between tours, just always trying to find a way to just like make a few bucks. So my best friend, uh, he was the manager at Jimmy John's and he hired all of our, all of his best friends. So yeah. it was like the best work environment ever. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, I was like making sandwiches and training at the time. And then um, I got offered a job at uh, OTM fight shops. Which used to be such a big deal. Like such now you just order gear online, yeah. but there used to be like only one like major fight shop. OTM was like 
the shop. Yeah, the yeah. shop. Like they like made the ev- all of the gear, all of the gear. Yeah, the they're best. like the original fight shop, yeah, right? <laughs> it's the best. So Scotty, um, he had like hit, like him and Ryan had a bunch of stores. It, they had one in Vegas, and then they had a few here in Cali. And at the time when I was working uh, there, I was also fighting as an amateur. So um, with people within like the local community noticed me, and then when they found out that I worked at OTM too, it kind of like kind of helped in a way because oh, then sure, they could come sure. in and talk, and yeah. then I could go into other gyms and be like, "Hey, what do you guys need?" So. Um, I made some pretty good changes there and like Scotty came to me one day he's like hey man like the numbers are super good at this store it hasn't been like this in forever he's like would you be willing to come out to Cali and do the same thing That's for so the cool. South Bay store and I was like yeah absolutely he's like if you want he's like I know you live here in Vegas he's like but uh, I can get you set up to train at Black House I know the guys over there uh, the store is not too far from the gym, so you can you you know still commute to the gym and work every day. And at the time, like you come to South Bay, it's one of the reasons I came out here. It was like the hotbed for MMA. I'm yeah. talking killers everywhere. Everywhere you could you'd walk any gym, and you're getting like the best work you've ever seen. It was like yeah. the golden age of fighting. It, it was really ridiculous. was. It was ridiculous. And so yeah, that's that's uh, yeah. I was working at the fight shop, and then I, I wasn't even professional yet. I didn't have my first pro fight until maybe close to the time that you and I sparred. You were ready to go. <laughs> you were ready to go. Yeah, man. And then uh, being at Black House, you, you'd, uh, I assume you'd spar with Anderson and Machida and all the boys all the time? I met Anderson at Black House. Uh, we had a, our first sparring session. It was like a dream come true. I, I'd always wanted to meet Anderson Same. Silva. And then he's like, hey, like, He's the nicest guy in the world. So nice. Yeah. And he's like, I like your energy. Like, yep. I'm getting ready to fight Nick Diaz. Come come to my camp. And I was like, what? Yep. Like, yeah, come to my camp. You come. And I was like, okay. So I stayed. Uh, I, mean, I was living in Cali already. So, um, yeah, I did, I did camp with him for the Nick Diaz fight. I'm sure you learned a ton from that. So much. And the training was like training that I've never seen before. He had multiple coaches, and he would do, you know, footwork stuff and reaction. And I yes. was like, this is amazing yeah and the, you got your master's degree in like how to run a camp yeah, yeah. And, and his facility was just top Second notch to right the yeah. Muay Thai college yeah. so um yeah that like that was also a part that was like also life-changing because if it weren't for that camp like that's where we really like made a strong connection and then after being with him for that is when he then started to like consider me like a little brother yeah you know and ap- actually before we left to Vegas he like sat me down during one of his interviews and he's like, Hey, come on, sit here. And I was like, okay. And so I'm just kind of sitting there and he like fully endorsed me. He's like, this guy's going to be a champion. He co-signed you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, even, even with me, he was like, you too relax. He could, he could, you too relax. I'm like, fucking tell me up before we go, dude. <laughs> yeah. I didn't know. So it, it's, it, I just, it started to give me more and more hope because like I said, like from going to losing weight to then fighting amateur, then getting a job, to just work in the fight shop, you know, I, ha- I always had like aspirations once I started fighting to be a professional or yeah. to be at the highest level, but I was still working there. It was like, you know, like my, my vision was happening kind of month to month basis. Yeah, it takes a while. I never said, I'm gonna be the champion. This is what I want and this is where I'm headed. But I, I think, and the same thing happened for me uh, with GSP. I went to his camp and I also went to Vitor Belfort's camp and like being around those guys, what you realize is yeah, they're at the pinnacle of the UFC and they're the face of the UFC and they're these world-class athletes and world champions and they're so freaking, you know, famous. But I think once you're around somebody for that long in that type of camp and you see the way it's structured, you just download so much data. But then you also realize, like, oh, they're just normal. They're like me. They have the same issues. Mm-hmm. They have the, you know, they, they go through the same ups and downs as I do. And you're like, oh, they're just normal. Yeah. And for me, it, like... You know, if you're a fan of Batman, it's like you see him without the suit and be like, oh, he's a normal ass dude, dude. Yeah. Like, I can do this. So I think once you're around it, it makes you realize, like, oh, I could do this. If they can do it, I can do it. Yeah. It makes it way more tangible. Yep. You know what I mean? And so, um, yeah, I think, I think I'm, there was just a point in all of this. I think up until, up until now, I'd kind of just been, not really like 
two feet in. You know, I've just I've just been like, ah, oh, let me touch. Okay, you, you know, like so much else confidence has come. Like so much step else you want to do though, too. You know, which I think a a lot of fighters. You, you know, and I interview fighters all the time, been around them all the time. But a lot of it is they don't have anything else to do, so they have to be two foot in. A, a, a blessing and a curse for you, and the same thing with me is I was also one foot in, one foot out because I want to do all this other stuff. But the problem is when you're fighting the UFC at that level, you if you're not two feet in, you're not going to be around long, man. Yeah. There's killers out there, dude, and you know this. Yeah. You know? So it, it's like, again, it's a, a double-edged sword. Mm -hmm. It's like, thank God you have all these other interests where you're going to make a beautiful living when you're done. But at the same time, if you don't water the grass over here, it's going to get dicey, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And there's nothing worse than, like, being half in, half out when you got another killer in front of you that's like hungry who's all ready to eat yeah right like that's a very similar situation for like that johnny walker fight like i just remember there was just so much going on and i was just so focused on like just the wrong things and i remember showing up to fight week and doing everything and i just wasn't fully there i emotionally mentally i would you know? love if they gave you that fight now i think you'd beat the shit out of It'd be that's, interesting. that's no shade on Johnny at all. I just think yeah, Johnny, great guy, yeah, yeah. great mo monster. You know, he, he. It's been tough, right? It's you know, been tough. After that fight, he even came up to me in the locker room afterward, and he's like, "Hey, man, like, I'm sorry to bother you. I just, I need to ask you a question." And I was like, "What?" He's like, "Did someone die in your family or something crazy?" Because he's like, "You just don't look like yourself this he's whole." Like, sad. He's like, "This whole week." Yeah. He's like, I wanted to ask you before we even fought, That's but so like, cool. he's like, yeah. I felt like I didn't want to overstep the boundaries, yeah. but like, you know, like, is everything all right with you? And I was just like, like, nah, man. I was like, just, <laughs> yeah. just please, go, please. Like, yeah, you know what I mean? Go. Like, this yeah. is the first time I've ever been KO'd. Yeah, you know, there's just, nothing worse. Like, you when know, your opponent's like hanging around, like, dude, I was appreciate it. Yeah, you know, but like, it's also like get away. When the emotion settled, I appreciated it. For sure, you know, and shows what kind of guy he is. Yeah, yeah, solid. So. Um, yeah, you gotta, gotta be all in. And I think I've gotten to a point now too, where I just, I've just matured a lot, man. You know, I can, I, I have an idea of what type of like man I want to be, yeah, you know, and what type of story I want to tell or, or just like picture that I want to paint. And but I, so, I also think you're, you're better at managing where you can still do this stuff you want to do with the fashion line, all that other stuff you want to do in your building. And you can still be all in, mm -hmm. you know, like at, it's more about managing. As you get older, experience that stuff comes. Yeah, you know? absolutely. So uh, we haven't talked much fighting. You know, again, this is what, why I wanted you on the show, you know, <laughs> but um, when it comes to fighting, you know, you've won your last two fights. That last one was vicious, dude. It was like you're back in the mosh pit days. Yeah, you're right. watching pride videos with your brother. I don't think I've seen a dude go for those old school pride kicks in a hot second, man. You just unleashed the fury on that poor kid. I think, so that's the second time that I've ever done a body kick while the guy was down. Oof. And uh, I think that also comes from like Vanderlei. <laughs> right? 100%. Like watching him and just like, you know, there's just something inside of some fighters that just when you unleash a certain fighting spirit, you like, you never know what's going to come out of it. And so, um, yeah, I think it was, it was just me just expressing like who I am and Had what I'm capable good. of. Had yeah, to feel good, right? it, it definitely felt good. Um, you know, it, I think. What felt be what, what felt the best is the win. You know, some sometimes, not all the time. Sometimes, like, I don't want to fight. You know, oh, like, yeah. Who are you, <laughs> you know what I mean. Dude, like sometimes, right. like I don't want to fight, Dude, and I don't. There's some day I'm like, is there? I hate to be shitty. Is yeah. there any way we could do this tomorrow? Like, yeah. I, I, I'm down to do it tomorrow. I just don't feel like doing it right now at yeah. 8 p.m. Yeah, like it doesn't matter, dude. You're an elephant in the circus. Circus goes live at eight. I'm like, I get that. If I can do it tomorrow, I guarantee I win. You make me do it tonight, it ain't gonna end well, man. It, it, it goes it's to a show, weird thing. It goes to show, like, I think as fighters, we should definitely get more respect because, like, it goes to show that we'd show up and we have to do what we have to do regardless of how we feel. Correct. You know what I mean? Like, and no matter what, like. If you have one matchup and then you do the same exact matchup the next day, you never know how it's going to go. 
And like you know, like some days you wake up and you know that you just feel like shit. Yeah, and you can't do anything about well, it. But but people at home watching this, even if you've never fought in steel cage in your underwear, you know, think about it when you're doing whatever job you have, your nine to five. Let's say you're a Starbucks employee. I don't give a hell what it is. Some days you wake up and you just don't feel like doing it. Same with fighters. Same with football players, soccer players, basketball. We're human. Sometimes you wake up like. I don't want to do it today, dude. <laughs> but I'm a fucking main event on a pay per view. Yeah, yeah. I have no choice. And I have to do it to the greatest of my abilities. Yeah, otherwise, I lose on consciousness. I get knocked out in front of millions of people. It's very embarrassing. So it's oh, and I get half my pay. Half the pay. Holler. And now, in the recent days, like just endless, pointless social media like bullshit. That if you're a human and you like to use your phone and you like to use social media. You want to subscribe to social media, yeah. The you troll's like, oh, like, that's why you got knocked out. Like, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and even if you just pass on, like, you still got to read it. And sometimes yeah. it's like, fuck, it's annoying and you just want to throw everything For away. Sure. So there's just a lot to come with it. But, like, we do have to learn how to control our emotions and still, like, kind of deliver on, on, you know, what we been training you just one of the toughest jobs in the world man it's yeah one of the toughest jobs in the world before we get you out of here i gotta my, my boy uh george would kill me if i didn't bring this up there's a, a young man he's out of chicago he's in the suburb of chicago he actually works for thick boy now but uh at the time he did not he's this young kid and uh he comes from a family of addiction he didn't have a lot going on and i do a show called uh king the sting in the wing with chris D'Elia and theo vaughn and fans call in. They call in, you know, the, you know, King or Sting it, whatever, burgers or whatever. And we, you know, riff off that and make jokes, a comedy show. And so this kid calls in and he's, uh, what, like 400 pounds? Four oh, low fours. Low fours. You know, he's 400 pounds and uh, not a fun 400 pounds, right? Mm. So uh, he gets on there. He's like, hey, I'm the biggest fan, man. He's like, shop, I'm a thick boy. And he's like, flexing, you know. And he's like, I love Khalil, you know, I love his story, blah, blah, blah. He's like, I'm trying to get down to 190. And, you know, in my head, I'm like, good luck, my man. You yeah. know, it's like, okay. But uh, I challenge him. I go, I'll tell you what, dude, if you get down to 190 and I go, you're brown on a plane? He goes, no, never. You ever stay in a hotel? He goes, no, never. I go, I'll tell you what, man, you get down to 190, you know, even get down to 200, which I didn't think would ever happen. Uh, you get down to 200, I will fly you out to L.A. and put you on the show and put, book you in a hotel. He's mm -hmm. like, all right, say less. I'm going to do it. We get off. You know, show ends. I'm like, there's no way this kid's going to lose freaking whatever, 200 pounds. Fast forward a year later, like, I don't know, six months ago? What was it? Six months ago. He's lost zero gowns worth of weight. Yeah, he, he's, down, he's, he's down to 190 now. He's it's down ridiculous. to 190. He's filmed a video. And he's like, what's up, Shab? I told you I didn't do it. I'm like, holy shit, you did it, dude. I'm like, well, man, on my word, I'll connect you with the team. We're going to fly ahead and put him on the show. So we put him on the show. He's the sweetest kid you've ever met. He's like your biggest fan. That's You're awesome. like his North Star. So, you know, he hasn't, with his lifestyle and taking care of his family and all the addiction stuff, he has every reason to be just, you know, a terrible human being. But he is the sweetest kid you've ever met. So he comes here, I meet him, we hit it off right away, and I go, uh, hey man, uh, next week I'm playing in San Antonio, I'm doing one of the biggest venues I've ever done, the AT&T Arena, mm. uh, where the Spurs are at. I said, uh, you should come, because he loves comedy. Like, he's balls deep in comedy and MMA. He's like us. And he goes, uh, I go, I'd love for you to come to the show. He's like, oh man, say less. I'm like, right, this is why we know I'm gonna fly you to San Antonio, and I'll put you up at my favorite hotel, because he's never stayed at hotels. Yeah. So um, Hotel Emma in San Antonio, is there's only one of them. Mm -hmm. it, you know, I've stayed in a million hotels. It's the best hotel on the goddamn planet. It's so unique. Mm. It's so well done. They have great coffee. Like, everything's detailed. It's like kind of steampunk kind of uh, vibes. It's so dope. Nice. So I uh, connect with the manager. I, I tell him the kid's story. And he goes, you know what? We're going to, not only are we going to cover his hotel, but we're going to give him our master suite that we save for, like, celebrities. I'm like, what? He's like, it's honest, man. This is a great story. So George flies out. We have a camera crew with him. And he gets in the hotel, and he's, you know, he's just freaking out. He's jumping in the pool. This kid has confidence. He's in the pool with his this flat titties splashing story. around. <laughs> this is an amazing It's great, story. dude. Comes to the show, and I have him with me the whole time. I bring him on stage. I tell everybody his story. He starts tearing up. But he's your biggest fan, dude. He loves you. And this is one of the reasons that I want to talk to you in front, on air, put a little pressure on you, because what you're doing is more than about you. 
mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like you, your journey and what you've gone through with your father and losing, you know, this weight and you know, it's it's no mistake you had influences like Vanderlei Silva and freaking Anderson Silva. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. That there's there's no mistake, man. It's because you're a good person, and everybody who meets you sees the value in you. You know what I'm saying? So, to me, when Chappelle told me you're gonna retire, I said he can't. Mm. And I don't mean to put pressure on you. I said he can't. I don't give a shit if you lose your next six. Yeah. But it's not about win or loss for you. Yeah. Your your it, your story is bigger than that. So I want to share that story about you with George. And we're gonna get a way for you guys to connect. And then also, yeah, that's so cool. Yeah, he's the best. So George, love shout out to George. He works for Thick Boy now. He's like one of our best employees. Yeah. He's like a Re- loyal ass. Reach kid. out to me through them. Yeah, through no, we'll my connect Instagram, you guys. Something connect. Yeah, we're send a picture. Yeah, maybe Facetime after this. But then also for coming on Food Truck, we have a, a segment I do now where I give uh, all the fighters a pair of shoes. Duh. I'm a sneakerhead. Okay. I'm a crazy sneaker yeah, head. I know. And I know. I know you're a fashion know. guy yourself. <laughs> I know. So, the, so what I, you so, got? I, well, this one I got, dude. <laughs> so my book is what I got, dude. Yours was. <laughs> yours made me nervous. So usually it's pretty easy. I know where to go with it. But with you, my boy Mike and Suplex Philly, shout out to Suplex Philly, the one who provide all the shoes. Okay. They're like the sneaker one-stop shop. Suplex Philly, any shoes you need, Suplex these are the guys that get it done. Okay. So I tell them your story. They, they know you. Like, oh, we love him. I'm like, right. So, but I was like, he knows fashion, dude. So we can't just give him like a random pair of Jordan or something like that. I go, we got to give him like a unique pair because he's a unique dude. There's not a lot of Khalil's out there in the world. So we got to get a pair that's – Rare, because you're a rare dude. And these, I don't have these. And we were the same size shoe. Oh, they, that says a lot. Dude, and when these that showed up in my lot. house, I texted them, <laughs> you have another pair? <laughs> they don't, because they're wow. very hard to find. Oh, my. The fragment. The fragment yeah. joints. They're so oh filthy. Oh, my God. I might put them on now. Dude, they are filthy. Filthy. Oh. One of my favorite wow. shoes ever, and I don't have them. Yo. Look at the back. They're Yo. so filthy, man. Albert is going to hate so hard. But yeah, wow. This is my gift to you, my man. You're a special this is dude. Such These are a special sick shoes gift. Wow. for a special person. Dude. Yeah. yeah, I love you, man. Man, yeah, that's love for thing. sure. So I want to also share something with you. So, um, around the, the realm of sneakers. So, um, I'm now the creative director of a company called The Label 318. They're out of Toronto. And what we do is um, say you like a Jordan 3, um, but you want your own version of an authentic, real Jordan 3. Like a silhouette Um, or something? Yeah, I I would, you know, personally work with the people of my, um, you know, of my choice to pretty much create their custom shoe. Oh, dude. So um, I do have a gift coming for you in the mail. That's why I texted you back your shoe size. Uh, that's a, you, so, you're yeah. the only fighter ever to be like, what's your <laughs> shoe size? Like, hey, dude, <laughs> this isn't like, a, we're not bonding over. Like, no, just give me your shoe. It's part of the show. So, we're like, what's your um, shoe size? I'm like, what? Yeah, I des- um, yeah, we designed a custom shoe for you, and it's made with a lot of, uh, with a lot of, Intention and love and I love and, it, man. I can't and wait. And admiration for everything that you yeah. guys do here and everything that you do. Yeah, um, man. I just want to share with you, man. Like, honestly, with the things that we've talked about in my journey and stuff, like you have been one of the biggest inspirations to me as far as what you've done with who you are, what you did in the fighting stuff, and what you're doing now. Mm, thanks, brother. And like, just for our own personal, you know, record, it's. There was a time where I saw your podcast and you had favored me to lose. And because I had looked up to you so much, like I had your birthday saved in my phone, which I thought was tomorrow. Uh, and uh, happy birthday, uh, by thanks. the way. Yeah, today is my birthday. <laughs> uh, um, I, was, no. I assume it's the Johnny Walker fight. No, it was the Kutalaba fight. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah you were like, this one's going to be the worst a tough part one. Of, it's the worst part of my gig. Bro. Yeah, he was like, you know, I just remember. Because like, I thought you were like one foot in, one foot out. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I hate making picks, It's, it's dude. okay. It, no, but, I apologize. But what happened is like I saw that and I was like, you know what? Fuck this That guy. like hurt my feelings. It you should. Know? Yeah, and I was like, I look up to this guy but he like it shows to me that he's like betting against me <sighs> so i was just like fuck brendan shaw makes sense like fuck this guy and i sure. just start blocking a bunch of people but i just want to let you know that like i'm on block yeah for sure oh, no you're God. you're on block yeah, you're like, still blocked because you're making picks but no right. but like i'll never pick against you ever again i'm sorry yeah. <laughs> no um respect though like i really do yeah, like thanks, I, everything that you do creatively thanks, you know, just it's it's sick, man. Yeah, yeah. I love it, man. Uh, this might be my favorite food truck we've ever done. So I love the fuck out of you, man. And 
Sky's the limit, dude. I'm proud of you, man. Thanks, man. Really, everybody. Super thick from my wallet to my check. I don't want it if